732 AD, year 110 of the Hagira, a month since we crossed the Pyrenees. Our army advances into the heart of Aquitania, scouting the region as we move forward. Thick forests and open fields abound, we made camp near a river crossing. The Frankish army is powerful, but their cavalry cannot match ours as long as we fight on an open field. Using our mobility to our advantage will prove vital in the battles ahead. El Cafiki will risk no error. He has a score to settle with the Frankish Count Odo of Aquitaine, the warlock who smashed an Umayyad army at Toulouse ten years ago. After such a long time, these two giants will finally meet again. The Frankish lands are divided and are no match for the organization of the Umayyad Caliphate. Capturing the city of Bordeaux will surely throw the region into chaos. Then, we will pounce on the scattered Frankish army like a cat upon a mouse. This will be the great razia or raid of our time. I can only pray that we are up to the challenge. With the blessing of Allah, the horn announcing our success sings a loud, shrill tone that echoes over the countries. Hearing our approach, Odo's army descended upon Bordeaux only to be trampled beneath our hoofs. Another Frankish army hastened south, but was no match for our brave seasoned warriors. A bloody battle ensued, and afterwards the Franks lamented their defeat, saying that God alone knows the number of the slain. With the Frankish army defeated, there is little standing between our magnificent forces in eternal glory as the conquerors of Europe. For centuries, history will remember us as the courageous warriors who defeated countless kings. My journey is at an end, but our triumphant army marches north to defeat one final adversary, a man who calls himself the Hammer, Martel in the Frankish tongue, foolishly believes that he can resist us. Soon enough, his feeble army will crumble and flee, just like the rest. You ask me if I know the epic of Sunjata, the great founder of the Mali Empire? <laughs> you were right not to seek out any ordinary storyteller, for I am Kuyate, Riot of the royal family. Listen well, and I will tell you this man, Sunjata. Sunjata was born to the second wife of the king of the Mandinka people. For the first several years of his life, he could not stand upright. A blacksmith made a sturdy iron rod so that the boy might prop himself up on it. But even that broke beneath him. Then, Sunjata found a branch from the sacred baobab tree, and miraculously, he took his first step. The king's first wife seethed with jealousy, however. She saw no reason for this feeble son of a second wife to take the throne over her own son. When the king died, she exiled Sunjata and his mother. They fled to faraway lands, but each kingdom feared the wrath of the Mandinka and would not take them. Only the Mema, far to the south, did not fear the Mandinka. They are a people of proud warriors, and among them, Sunjata learned how to hunt and fight. He left his disability behind and became as fierce and strong as a lion. Before long, he was ready to take back his rightful place on the throne. When he arrived, however, he found the Mandinka capital in flames. warriors from the far north had overrun the capital on the river, slaughtered the new king and all of the royal family, and claimed the land of the Mandinka for their lord, Sumanguru. Sunjata barely escaped the raiding parties ravaging his homeland. As the only survivor with a claim to the Mandinka throne, Sunjata would never truly be safe. Sunjata knew that he had to bide his time and hide from the Soso spies until he was strong enough to strike back. 
Umanguru was a cruel tyrant and a sorcerer in command of powerful spirits. He was said to possess a magical balafo which would grant him victory if he played it. Whether or not Sumanguru had magical powers, he was above all an ambitious conqueror seeking to seize the lands of the old empire of Ghana, a golden kingdom of great wealth and sophistication lost to the desert. Sunjata knew that contesting such a man would be difficult. The Soso had allied with other tribes in the north, the Jolof, the Diafanu, and others who profited immensely from Soso control over the Saharan trade routes. With such powerful allies and their armies, no one dared to rise up against them. Sunjata had one advantage. He was still remembered as the crippled prince of the Mandinka. As long as this was believed, the Soso would dismiss him as inconsequential and he could build his own army. To provide proof of his miraculous transformation from crippled boy to strong prince, he took up the Bebo branch from his youth and began a journey. From people to people and kingdom to kingdom, he traveled to rally support and prove that he was strong enough to retake his ancestral lands from Sumanguru. Sangaran, Labe, Niger, Kabon, and Ouagadougou. One by one, the kingdoms of the south and east rallied to Sunjata. But for every king who supported the Mandinka prince, it seemed that Sumanguru conquered three others. As successful as Sunjata had been, his coalition could not hope to defeat the Soso just yet. Sunjata needed a better plan. Shredder came to Sunjata from beyond the Sahara Desert. He had a deep, thick Arabic accent and told of great gold deposits in Sumanguru's lands. But Sumanguru did not permit the traders access to this gold. The tyrant gave his allies control over the gold and salt trades, leaving the merchants at their mercy. This trade was the flowing blood in the veins of these kingdoms. If the blood stops flowing, the body will wither. Sunjata thought about the merchant's words. The next day, he assembled a band of raiders. If trade was the blood of Sumanguru's empire, then Sunjata would drain it, just as one drains an animal after a hunt. Sunjata raided with unbridled success, with trade diverted into Mandinka lands. Allegiance to Sumanguru began to waver across his empire. Sunjata put the gold he gained to good use, assuring that his people and allies profited from the new riches. He had proven himself not only an able commander, but also an able king. With his newfound successes came greater attention though. Every city in West Africa bellowed the name of Sunjata the Lion, King of the Mandinka, the King of Mali. Sumanguru could no longer afford to ignore the once crippled prince. He assembled a vast army for war. A beast is most dangerous when cornered. Sumanguru was no different. He struck southward into the Mandinka heartland where he had slaughtered Sunjata's family before. He was rumored to have brought his mystical balafon with him to summon victory, and griots were already singing that the war had been won by the sorcerer before it had even begun. Sunjata met him by the Niger River at a place called Kirina. A long line of Soso and Jolof warriors stood tall, banging their shields and leaning at the soldiers of Sunjata's coalition. Horses and camels brought to the field of battle kicked up enough sand to shroud the sun at noon. Sumanguru himself took to the field in the dusty twilight, and Sunjata faced him from across the hot expanse. As the armies prepared to charge, the music of a balafon began to flow through the air. The decisive moment was at hand, and all of West Africa awaited the victor. 
armies crashed against each other. They buckled and wrenched, bristling serpents coiling and writhing amidst the clamor of weapons and the rumble of hooves. Many times, the Malian soldiers faltered, but at critical moments, Sunjata would ride across the lines to rally his men, inspiring them to push on and prevail. At long last, the Soso onslaught slowed and their resolve began to fade. Sensing that the tide had turned, Sumanduru abandoned his men and fled into the mountains. At the sight of their leader in flight, the exhausted Soso lines collapsed. The celebrations lasted for days, with the most bountiful feasts ever seen. All the kings of the coalition gathered to proclaim Sunjata, their Mansa, the king of kings. Mali had become an empire, and Sunjata, its emperor. Mali now dominated the land on both sides of the great Niger River. Mansa Sunjata reigned freely from the gold mines of Bambuk to the city of Gao. But more was needed to stabilize the empire. Sumanguru fled to his stronghold of Kumbi Saleh, still wreaking havoc wherever he could. As long as he lived, he would be a threat to the peace of the realm. Sunjata called upon his men once again and began a long siege of the mighty Soso capital and former seat of the Ghana Empire. Sunjata would not be denied his final victory. With peace in the empire and the deaths of his family avenged, Mansa Sunjata settled well into his role as the ruler of Mali. In peace, he was as effective an emperor as he was in war, building markets and monuments across his lands. He was a model for all emperors to follow, making his country a center of learning and culture at the edge of the Sahara. And so I remain to tell his story. Balafaseke Kuyate is my name. His humble family historian, a griot of superb bloodline and patronage. And this is Sumanguru's Balafon which I stole before the battle at Kirina and played that day to inspire the victory of Sunjata. Aksum, the heart of our empire and the cradle of Ethiopian civilization. Even so, every time a caravan stops here to sell its wares, the city seems less grand. More roofs need thatching, Fewer shops are open, and even the shouts of the hawkers are ever so slightly less audible. My son doesn't notice, of course. Ever since we entered the city, the boy has stared in awe at every building. It is a marvelous sight for a country lad living in the northern highlands. As we passed a church, a set of golden curtains caught his eye. Father, have you ever seen such a treasure? Why does nobody guard it? Are they not afraid of thieves? I could not help but smile. Why hire strong arms when even the queen dares not take them? A deep frown creased my son's brow. The boy apparently did not know the story of his ruler yet. Forty years ago, when our queen, Yodit, was but a princess, she discovered the very reason why those curtains do not need any guards. Yodit was truly beautiful. Every lord in the empire competed for her hand, much to the displeasure of Gidajan, her nephew and the heir to the throne. Gidajan devised a plan to be rid of her. In the night, he stole the golden curtains and hid them in her room. When the palace guard discovered the treasure, she was locked in the deepest cells. Luckily, there were some who refused to believe the accusations. One loyal captain named Samuel helped her escape through a secret tunnel. My son smiled when he heard of Yodit's escape. As long as she stayed in the Ark Sumite Empire, however, Yodit would never be safe from Prince Gidejan. Her journey had nearly begun. Despite the late hour, the market of Aksum was still crowded. 
Vendors shouted from several wooden stalls, describing their goods, ports of silk from the Far East, Olibanum incense from Arabia, bracelets made from Egyptian glass, our own Ethiopian ivory. Tired of browsing the stalls, we sat down on a low wall next to a shop. Father, Daniel said, will you please tell me the rest of your deed story? Despite my fatigue, I decided to entertain the boy. Yodit traveled north for many years, searching for someone who could help her seek revenge for the humiliation she had suffered at the hands of Gidejan. Eventually, when making camp near the border of Egypt, the princess had rumor that perhaps presented the opportunity she had been awaiting. The Syrian prince Anubis was traveling the region looking for a suitable bride. But how could she, an exiled princess, convince such a powerful man. Of course, Zanobis was impressed by Yodit's achievements. He sought after this famous princess and asked her to marry him. Daniel responded, Queen Yodit is truly a strong woman, Father. How did she... I quickly raised my hand to stop him. No, sir. No more questions now. It will soon be dark, and we need to return to the inn. The meal will do us both much good. Perhaps I shall tell you about one of her great victories before going to bed. <laughs> <laughs>